Uh, I'll be reading uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Chapter 4, 1 through 6. Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifest, manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Thank you, brother, so much. And it's such a blessing to be able to come back together and study another portion of God's Word. We are looking at the life of Jesus, and we're looking at uh, Jesus being the light of the world and focusing in on the lessons for this week. Uh, we looked at this morning the, um, the darkness not liking the light, the darkness not wanting anything to do with the light, and the light um, exposing the darkness. And as we accept that and we acknowledge and uh, recognize the sin uh, that's in our lives rather than uh, shunning the light. Uh, remember, the darkness hates the light as we accept the light and we allow it into our lives and recognize the sin problem that we have. Jesus then offers us um, a, a way in which we can be excused. Uh, we can be forgiven. We can be cleansed from that sin problem. And then uh, we can live a life glorifying God, uh, putting aside the sin as we feast upon uh, the, the light, as we walk in the light, and uh, at the same time, uh, glorifying God through our thriving in the gospel. It's not just putting aside that which is unrighteous and wicked. It's also picking up that which is righteous and that which is uh, holy, that which is the, uh, the will of God and his, his commandments. And so uh, this afternoon, we're looking at the light which shines in our hearts, looking at Paul's passage there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And uh, we're going to think about this from the, from the view of knowing other people or knowing another situation based upon how it's been described, and then ultimately not seeing it, but then eventually seeing it. So maybe you've uh, had something described to you before, maybe it is a uh, venue of some kind of sporting event and it's been described for you, what the experience is, is like. Uh, maybe you've had a certain person uh, at a certain you know, whether it be congregation or a certain school or a certain community of some kind that is uh, well known or would be recognized or would be um, identified by others that you've never met, but someone's describing this person to you. Uh, or maybe like a game of Clue, for example, if you've ever, not Clue, not Clue, hold on, not, Pict not Pictionary either. What's that game that we play? Guess Who? That's what it is. Guess Who? Uh, play it all the time at the house. The, the, alternate version of Guess Who, but it's the same idea, where you guess the various people uh, that you have, that you've chosen, and the other person is going through all the different folks uh, that could be that person. Um, in any of those situations, you come into this spot, whatever it is, where you now are seeing the one that you've had described to you, or the situation you've had described to you, or uh, the Guess Who game, and you said, that, that's exactly what I thought that would look like. That's exactly what I thought that would be. That's how it was described to me. That's how it was uh, uh, understood. That, that's how it was laid out for me so that I could almost picture that in my mind and when I'm now before it, that's it. Well, I want you to think about God. And I want you to think about trying to understand who God is. Who does God look like? How do we think of God? Uh, and as we think about this, we understand, uh, as we just read a few minutes ago in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 through 6, and as we've studied before and been reminded, that Jesus is the express image of his person. Hebrews chapter 1 in verse 3. As a matter of fact, the apostles, as they're trying to uh, learn more and more about God, as they're talking to him in the flesh, 
Uh, you might remember what is said to Jesus, as Philip will tell Jesus in Luke chapter 14. Uh, Luke chapter 14, you see that uh, it is, um, excuse me, John chapter 14, I'm reading Luke 14, I'm like, that's not right. John chapter 14, uh, Philip says to, to Jesus uh, in verse 8, Lord, show us the Father and it suffices us. Uh, they are talking to God in the flesh, and he asks to see the Father. He wants to know, what, what does God look like? Who is God? And Jesus responds, verse 9, <clears throat> Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, and how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Uh, verse 11, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sakes. In other words, how is it that I could be doing the miracles that I'm doing, transcending the laws of nature the way that I am, unless what I am saying is authorized by Almighty God? What I'm saying is indeed divine, and that includes, by the way, that if you want to see the Father, who does Jesus say to look to? <laughs> look to Him. Look to Him. Now, there are three separate personalities. Uh, there are three members of the Godhead. Uh, but Jesus is telling us if we want to know who God is, we look to Him. And so we have a blessing of being able to know um, God by looking to Jesus. And so what does the light of Jesus reveal to us about God? How can we have God describe to us so that, just like in that case of the game of guess who, or uh, how things might be described to us, and then we show up and boom, that's exactly how we thought it was going to be. What does God's word tell us about God? Number one, God is love. God is love. Go with me to 1 John. We'll be in 1 John before we go to Romans 5, but let's start in 1 John. And look with me beginning there in chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. John says there that God is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, God is love. He who does not, uh, does not love does not know God, for God is love. Notice also, starting in verse 9, in this the love of God was manifested toward us. That God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The satisfying of God's wrath is achieved in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the sacrifice in our stead, in our place of the wrath that we are deserving to receive from Almighty God. And so if we want to understand who God is, then we understand and need to understand love. And the more that we look at love, the more we look at the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. That is the manifestation of the love of God, the sacrifice of Jesus. Notice again, verse 9. Go with me to chapter 3, same book, 1 John chapter 3. Notice verse 16, by this we know love. So God is love. Well, how do we know love? How do we identify love? How do we understand love? How do we describe it? How could it be described to us? Here it is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. So the gift that he gave, the sacrifice that he endured on our account is love. Uh, look then at Romans chapter 5. Same concept here being described in another way. We have the apostle John there in his first epistle. But look at uh, what Paul provided in Romans chapter 5. Notice here in verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so we can understand this as it relates to our own lives. Uh, we are willing to sacrifice for our children, to do a great deal for our children, uh, and even with our own children, there are certain lives that we have. Uh, we are, yes, willing to lay down our life, we're willing to, to go the distance, uh, but at the same time, uh, our patience does eventually run thin. Uh, you think about those that maybe we're close to, friends, colleagues, family members, 
uh, those who we would deem as acceptable or in some way living moral lives. Well, we might be willing to stick our neck out for them. But now you take someone who is corrupt. You take someone who is a criminal. You take someone who is uh, scum of the earth type material. Would you be willing to stick your neck out for them? God died for us, and we are in that situation. As a matter of fact, in this very context, verse 10, we're described as enemies. We are in opposition to him, and yet he died for us. And so what does the light of Jesus reveal? What is our understanding of who Jesus is? How can we think about Jesus being in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds? And how can we know that we know Jesus? Love. Love. Uh, God is love. God is also, point number two, truth. God is truth. Uh, John 14 and verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You know, our world today in a postmodern society has all kinds of ideas regarding truth. They think truth is whatever you want it to be. I can't tell you how many songs now that I hear, and I've, I've really kind of gotten sick of it. I've even been able to identify some of the songs where they say something to the effect in the song, I'm just going to go be with my truth. These are popular songs. Uh, that is very common in today's world. Uh, think about how watered down that is. Think about how irrelevant, inconsistent, illogical that is. Uh, truth is not something that is defined based upon someone's whim. And it is a blessing to know that. Well, who is truth? What is truth? God is. God is. God is truth. Paul tells Titus in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, God cannot lie. God cannot lie. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 3. You have John the Immerser describing who Jesus is and describing uh, uh, those who hear Jesus and the way in which they might respond. Verse 33 of John chapter 3. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. Well, you think about what God has said from the very beginning of creation, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Then receiving the testimony of Jesus, uh, receiving the gospel, what are they looking back into? The history of time and that everything that God has said from the very beginning of creation has indeed come to pass. He delivered on his promises. You look at John 17 and verse 3. John 17 and verse 3 in the prayer that Jesus says unto the Father. In verse 3 it states, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Uh, God is love. God is truth. You might say, well, we have a society today that doesn't understand love, and they don't understand truth. Well, guess what? That's directly correlated with a misunderstanding, a lack of understanding, an absence of understanding regarding God. The more that we know God, the more that we know love. The more that we know God, the more that we know truth. Uh, God is also grace. God is grace. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 10. Notice what Peter states. Uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 10. Peter says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. Look at Jude, verse 4. Jude and verse 4. Jude writes, For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness, and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that exactly what denominations do today when they say, hey, we're saved by grace alone, and then they just go do whatever they want to do? That's exactly what Jude is talking about. Jude is saying, wait a second, <laughs> folks who behave that way, who live in lewdness, who live in a way contrary to the will of God, they are not operating according to his will. They are not living in the grace of God. They are turning it into something that it is not. Well, the grace of God has appeared to all men. That doesn't mean that all men are saved uh, by God's grace. Now, those who are saved are saved by grace, but all men are not saved by grace. Grace is not unconditional, 
But the grace of God that he has provided, uh, the grace of his word has been unconditionally given, and that has been, been provided to mankind. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Um, the grace that then is granted through salvation as we obey the grace that has been granted through his word is available to all of us. Uh, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, his son. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Uh, God has provided us graciousness in his word and in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to think about and understand and better recognize, become sensitive to, intimate with the light which shines in our hearts, uh, who Jesus is. He is love. He is truth. He is grace. He is comfort. He is comfort. Uh, God is the God of all comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And what comfort does God provide? Well, he provides us an escape from no longer being enslaved to the fear of physical death. Think about that. We get to walk around every day and live liberated from being fearful that we might die and something physical might happen bad in our lives. And if you contemplate that for a second to modern society, especially to our young people, that is a fascinating message. Why? Because young people, due to social media, due to humanism, due to secular society, putting them in utter fear over all kinds of things, are walking around anxiety-filled and terrified by all of these boogeymen that society has propped up. But living in Christ, knowing Jesus, means I get to live liberated from that fear. Why? Well, because this physical life, it is what it is. And he took on flesh and blood and shared in our own physical difficulties that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil. So he therefore has released us who through fear of death were all our lifetime subject to bondage. Reference Hebrews chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. We no longer have to live in fear of our physical lives crumbling and dying. We no longer have to live that way. Uh, God is the God of all comfort. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. God offers us comfort. He is comfort. He wants us to cast all our care upon him for he cares for us. First Peter chapter five and verse seven. So who is Jesus? Jesus is love. Jesus is truth. Jesus is grace. Jesus is comfort. Uh, God is strength. He is strength. Have you ever felt weakened? Have you ever felt diminished? Have you ever felt because of Social reasons, maybe your peers, maybe your co-workers, maybe family. They've cast you aside and they've completely blocked you out. They've misrepresented you. They've destroyed you. And in all of that, you have felt like absolutely nothing. But guess what? As a Christian... Even with all of those physical circumstances and context being the way that they might be, we're still stronger than ever. Why? Because if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8 and verse uh, 31. Uh, Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. We get to know He who created all of the world, who sustains all of the world, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, in Jesus. We get to know God. We get to know true 
strength. I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, in the corporate world, uh, you can go through some doozies. And I've been through some difficulties. I'm not going to compare it to anybody else, but it's been hard. And I maybe have shared some of this with some of y'all. But I have found myself in utter shambles, weeping in stairwells, dreading being around certain coworkers, just because simply there are efforts that exist to completely destroy the career of others. It doesn't matter what you do, and the more you do to achieve what it is that you've been told to do, the more wrong you're told you are. That's a very hard spot to be in. Predominantly happened roughly, I cannot even believe I'm saying this, but seven years ago, it felt like yesterday in some ways. I mean, it's, it's that close. But I will never forget, because it was all here and coming. I'll never forget when that path started. And by the way, it wasn't quick. It took years, and it was hard, really hard. But I will never forget being with my brethren, opening the Bible, preaching the gospel, teaching Bible classes, fellowshipping in the truth. And no matter how deflated I was, this right here is strength. Because it cannot be moved. And it does not change. And even if the world around you is crumbling, in God you have everything you need. You are the majority. That's strength. That's what Jesus has shown us. And he went to the fullest extent in showing us this, did he not? All forsook him as he stood trial, in a legal trial. He was denied. He was prosecuted unjustly. He was put to death unrighteously. And all that while, we know how he felt because he said how he felt. He cried out and told us how he felt. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He felt alone. But what happened in the end? He rose from the grave. He is strength. So when we think about Jesus, and we think about Jesus being known by us, living in our hearts, living in our minds, living as we live out our lives. We know that Jesus is love. Jesus is truth, grace, comfort, strength, righteousness. Our final point. God is righteousness. John tells us in 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 10, 1 John 3 and verse 10, in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. You know, sometimes Calvinists will say, well, you know what? Uh, we become righteous when we are Christians. They literally will say, and there's a song, by the way, I won't ruin it for you, but that gets this idea of we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. In other words, it doesn't matter how you live. The righteousness of Jesus is proxied over you whether you want it to be or not. And that's Calvinism and it's utter error. John makes it crystal clear, not just here, by the way, that those who practice righteousness are righteous. And those who do not practice righteousness are not righteous. But God is that very source. God is the one that we feast upon and that we look to in order for our lives to then be defined as righteous. And Paul will explain this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning there in verse 29. We looked at this this morning as well, that no flesh should glory in his presence. We skipped over to verse 31, but notice verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That is what we have in Jesus. Uh, it's not our own righteousness as it was in the case of the Jews, Romans chapter 10 in verse 3, but rather it is the righteousness that is true righteousness that comes 
from God, being able to then ourselves be instruments of righteousness to God. Romans chapter 6 and verse 13. God gives us that ability through Jesus Christ. Uh, God is righteousness. What a blessing it is to get a picture of who God is when we look to Jesus, to understand more about who Jesus is, to understand the qualities of his light and what aspects and traits uh, that we can better understand to be closer to a knowledge and a lifestyle that thrives in that light. He is the light of life. He is the light of life. What a blessing it is to know that. Uh, John chapter 8 and verse 12. Maybe you're here this afternoon and you're not yet a child of God. Won't you make the decision to become one? We learn how that's done in Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. It's by being baptized into Christ. Uh, we learn that that's to be done based upon one's belief and confession in Christ. Mark chapter 16, 15, and 16, as well as Acts chapter 8, 34 through 39. Have you done that yet?